My name is Nicholas Carr from the University of Florida. I'll be serving as chair for this wonderful panel. Uh, and we have a great lineup of researchers and practitioners doing work on electoral justice and related issues uh, throughout several African countries. Uh, we are still waiting to, you know, uh, on our panelists, all of our panelists, but based on the program, I think what we're going to do is start off with uh, Sonali Campion of University of East Anglia, who's doing some fantastic research on, um, on the uh, 2019 Malawi elections. Uh, we're just going to go ahead in the same format that we have been doing so far with the conference, probably about a 50 minute um, presentation and then we'll move on to um, our next uh, presenter, Morgan uh, Wack. Uh, and um, then we have a period of um, discussion um, comments. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from uh, Gabriela Taruco. And then we'll open it up to a period of question and answers. Um, so over to you, Sonali. Thanks so much. Okay, can you see my screen? There we go. Right. We can see it. Right. Um, so today I am talking about a draft paper entitled uh, Critical Capacity Lessons from the Nullification of Malawi's 2019 Presidential Election. Um, so to provide the context for what happened uh, in February 2020, the Malawi High Court overturned the presidential election result. Uh, it did not find conclusive evidence of, of manipulation in favor of a particular candidate. Instead, the emphasis was on widespread and systematic irregularities, primarily attributed to the Malawi Electoral Commission's failure to follow legal procedures. It was only the second time a court had declared a presidential election null and void in Africa. Um, the first time was in uh, Kenya in 2017, which I'll touch on later in the presentation. The ruling challenged the assumption that courts are reluctant to overturn presidential election results and represented a victory for the rule of law and citizens who mobilized to demand electoral justice. It was subsequently upheld by the Supreme Court and a fresh presidential election was held in June 2020. So to provide a bit of context, um, I'm a doctoral researcher uh, seeking to better conceptualize capacity in the context of election management bodies. Uh, and Malawi is one of my case studies. So I've been looking at elections in the multi-party era, i.e. since uh, 1993, 1994. Um, I draw on primary and secondary literature to trace how EMB capacity has evolved over time and what constrains or enables it. I'm therefore conscious that Malawi's elections have always suffered from serious administrative shortcomings. And comparing the 2019 elections to earlier polls, it is noticeable that actually several aspects of the administration were much better than any previous election. At least three earlier elections were unsuccessfully challenged on the grounds of flawed election management, which for me raises two questions that I try to address in this paper. Firstly, what are the long-standing problems which have stood in the way of approving election management over time? And secondly, what were the factors that contributed, the contextual factors that contributed to the nullification in 2019? The purpose of this paper is not to dispute the judgment, um, as the evidence presented in court did demonstrate that there were serious problems in the counting and tabulation of votes. However, the problems weren't new, so understanding why they persisted from earlier elections is really important. In addition, the court's decision to pursue the case and the eventual ruling were clearly also shaped by contextual factors. In addressing these questions, the paper provides empirical insights into election administration and electoral justice in Malawi. It also advocates for the electoral governance network approach to understanding EMB capacity which in itself is an understudied area. So just briefly uh, to introduce election management bodies, I'm sure many of you here are familiar with what they are, um, but they are the primary institutions tasked with election delivery, and we often call them EMBs for short. 
So in order to deliver credible elections, EMBs need to be independent from political interference, have sufficient capacity, and that refers to everything from resources to expertise to organizational infrastructure. They also need to inspire trust among citizens and other electoral stakeholders. All of these qualities are interdependent and need to be maintained on an ongoing basis. While there has been a substantial literature on EMB independence, and the growing body of work on trust in EMBs and other democratic institutions, there's been relatively little uh, on EMB capacity, although I'm aware that our chair is actually uh, doing a lot of work on this gap. Uh, so turning to electoral governance networks, a part of the challenge of studying uh, EMB capacity is the interorganizational complexity of election delivery. So we know that elections are highly complex administrative undertaking involving a wide range of network, a wide network of institution and actors. Although there may be one or two designated EMBs, many critical electoral cycle activities are conducted wholly or partly by others. For example, government departments or civil society. So Toby James has proposed that rather than studying election management in a narrow institutional terms, we can learn more from looking at the broader electoral governance networks by considering the range of actors involved in the realization of elections and the strategies that, and, that they deploy and, and to shape the course of electoral processes, it is possible to develop a much more nuanced understanding of the election management ecosystem. So I draw on this perspective in addressing my two research questions. So this slide looks a bit scary and I won't go into all of it, but basically uh, in my analysis, I look at three key stages of the electoral cycle and focus on the national elections between 1999 and 2014. So it's not intended as an exhaustive review of all the problems that arose, but it's designed to illustrate the level of administrative dysfunction which characterized some of these earlier polls. So the first recurring issue that the uh, Malawi Electoral Commission faced, and I, I abbreviate it to MEC, so that's the MEC in there, um, is that its pre-election preparations were repeatedly disrupted by political factors. So national elections are held every five years in Malawi, um, and while this should guarantee ample planning time, it actually never had more than 18 months to prepare for any of these elections. Um, and turning to voter registration, until the mid 2010s, Malawi lacked a reliable system for recording births, deaths or citizenship, which made it really difficult to estimate the voting population and to verify who was eligible to vote. Before every election, a national exercise had to be undertaken to prepare the register, and each time there were widespread problems with logistics, staff and technology. In 1999 and 2000, election day had to be postponed in order to allow for the finalization of the register. In 2009 and 2014, the data collected during the exercise were very poor and large scale labor intensive exercises in data cleaning had to be undertaken, which directed resources and energy away from other necessary election day preparations. The law in Malawi stipulates a legal deadline for the announcement of results. However, this deadline has repeatedly put pressure on MEC during the results management process. Basically, the uh, process has invariably ended up being much slower and more difficult than planned. For example, systems designed to speed up results transmission failed in 2009 and 2014, in large part because they were designed to reject results sheets with arith arithmetic errors. These unfortunately were commonplace due to counting conditions where workers were incredibly fatigued and often poorly trained in the procedures. In 2014, the results process was so chaotic that the incumbent president tried to annul the election during tabulation, but was blocked from doing so by the court. MEC acknowledged widespread anomalies and sought an extension of the results deadline in order to conduct a recount, but this was denied. So as I mentioned, in 2019, key elements of the process were actually much better run. So two out of three of the key issues um, that I've just discussed were actually largely resolved. MEC had the full five years to prepare for the election and took full advantage of the time by introducing a variety of operational and structural reforms. 
The registration process was transformed by the establishment of a national identification system combined with biometric registration. Registra registering each voter was much quicker and the data collected was more reliable. As a result, both the register and pre-election period in general inspired much greater stakeholder confidence. However, the problems in counting and results tabulation were very similar to 2014, and it was ultimately these problems that led to the nullification of the presidential result. So to answer my first question, um, which was uh, what are the long-standing problems which have stood in the way of improving election management over time, I identify two key factors. The first is MEC's constrained capacity. So we've seen on the previous slides how the outcomes of this lack of capacity range from inadequate management, overly complicated procedures, uh, and poor training uh, for temporary staff, just to name a few. But when we apply the electoral governance network lens, this encourages encourage us to look at the wider constraints on MEC's capacity. So we've seen that despite being a permanent and constitutionally established institution, MEC's ability to function has been periodically interrupted. Despite the law guarantee, guaranteeing MEC's financial independence, it is actually heavily dependent on the Ministry of Finance and international donors. Protracted budget negotiations, delayed approvals, and unpredictable access to funds has frequently disrupted operational planning and procurement. MEC is further impacted by the capacity of limitations of other actors and institutions in the electoral governance network. For example, media outlets have often cited a lack of resources uh, when challenged on their failure to provide equitable coverage of all political parties. In recognition of this, these constraints, MEC routinely recruits a cohort of journalists who are trained in election reporting and deployed around the country to supplement the media houses coverage. This is a really great initiative, um, but it demonstrates one area where the EMB has become responsible for making up capacity shortfalls elsewhere in the network. Finally, the operating environment presents significant challenges which MEC cannot fully control, but nevertheless must overcome to deliver its mandate. For example, it is revealing that the rollout of a national ID system ahead of 2019 led to radical improvements in the voter registration process. With the national ID infrastructure in place, MEC's specific task became much more straightforward. Secondly, the failure of electoral reform has really constrained MEC. Malawi's electoral framework has from the outset contained shortcomings that complicate the delivery of elections. Various multi-stakeholder commissions and task force have reviewed electoral laws over the years and provided substantial proposals. However, a lack of political will has stymied efforts to harmonize and strengthen electoral laws. The failure of the law re reform process in the wake of the 2014 elections was particularly disappointing. The degree of chaos surrounding the results process meant all stakeholders recognized the need for major reforms to build, rebuild confidence in the electoral system. Some minor amendments were made but more ambitious reforms, for example, to uh, increase MEC's autonomy, were not. So while MEC made concerted efforts to introduce administrative reforms ahead of 2019, the legal and political reforms that were needed to enhance the framework and wider environment within which MEC operated were not forthcoming. So turning to the second question, which is what were the conditions that made the nullification possible in 2019? A key one is the trust deficit. So uh, Afro barometer data dating back to 1999 demonstrates that MEC actually initially enjoyed growing citizen confidence despite poor performance and some concerns regarding its impartiality. However, this trust declined precipitously in the wake of 2014 fueled by the conduct of the election itself and subsequent investigation into management fraud at the highest levels. The environment in 2019 was such that when problems did emerge during counting and tabulation, there was less inclination towards acceptance. A coalition of civil society organizations mobilized mass protests demanding electoral justice and specifically the removal of MEC's chair. The protests were more sustained and had greater popular support than any previous election challenge. 
We also find that uh, the margin of victory in 2019 was just 3.16%, which is the narrowest margin of any presidential election in Malawi. Uh, in early elections, uh, the margin between the top two candidates was never less than 6%, which made it harder to argue that the irregularities could have made material difference to the results. Thirdly, the Kenyan precedent was in place uh, in 2019. So uh, in 2017, the Supreme Court of Kenya overturned the presidential election result, and it concluded that the flaws in the EMB's administration of the election raised reasonable doubts as to whether the election was a free and fair expression of the will of the people. This ruling actually stood in stark contrast to 2013, when the Supreme Court had upheld the presidential election result in response to a similar petition. So there was a marked shift in not substantively interrogating challenges to scrutinizing the evidence in detail and ruling in favor of the petitioners. Although the Malawi High Court did not directly cite the Kenyan judgment, there are striking similarities in the two cases. So to conclude, um, there's sort of two sets of lessons here. One, uh, one set for Malawi itself. So MEC took the blame uh, for a lot of the problems in 2019, and clearly there is work to do. Um, and that ranges from cultivating institutional memory uh, so that they can learn from the challenges, um, simplifying procedures, improving internal communication uh, and, and training. However, additional work is needed to build the capacity of a wider electoral governance network um, in order to facilitate MEC to do its job effectively. For example, by expanding the provision of civic education. Electoral reforms are also needed to enhance the framework within which MEC operates. The High Court ruling advocated for electoral reform, and as a result, there actually has been some progress in this area, um, but we will see next year uh, how much uh, this impacts election delivery. More broadly, this study seeks to demonstrate uh, that in order to understand capacity and what shapes it, a narrow focus on the institution can be unhelpful. Elections are inherently ensemble works, so it is vital to consider all elements of the electoral governance network. This can provide important information on the constraints and capacities which exist outside the EMB, but nevertheless impact its ability to deliver. In addition, this study shows that capacity is multifaceted. The variety of activities EMBs need to undertake necessitates a wide range of skills and resources and effective management and organizational systems. So while studies on individual aspects of capacity can be immensely valuable, more research is needed into how organizations can be strategic in developing a range of necessary capability and resources. Thank you. Sonali, thanks so much. Um, a very uh, intriguing research on the Malawian case. Um, we'll definitely be in, in, in contact, right? Because so much of our work overlaps. So thanks so much. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to have Morgan Wack um, present his work uh, related to the Kenyan 2023 um, elections. Um, as well, and Morgan is working along with Maddie Jalbert at the University of Washington. Uh, over to you, Morgan, and thanks so much. Great. Yes, thank you. I am uh, attempting to get this pulled up so that we can all see it collectively. <laughs> so, one minute. All right. I think it may just be that I have to present this without my notes on the same screen, but that is all right. Maureen, if you want to just take a minute um, doing so, that's fine. We have Can time. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, terrific. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I uh, looking forward to giving this talk on a new sort of draft paper as well. Uh, I think this goes it pairs well with Sonali's talk, and I think uh, got a a good overview here. Um, from her on the state of judicial decisions and the 
use of electoral management bodies in in the region, uh, which is great because I don't talk as much about sort of the background and the actual institutional aspects. Um, and so that was a, a terrific um, intro with probably a lot more substance on that side. So so that's great. I'm talking specifically today about um, a paper which we we've gone back and forth on on the title. So happy to to hear feedback. But right now we're calling it courting controversy. Judicial Decisions, Trust, and Misinformation in Elections, and I'm presenting it on behalf of me and my co-authors. Um, and specifically, this paper looks at the recent Kenyan election from 2022 and the appeal process that occurred in the aftermath of the election uh, and the eventual upholding of the election results by the election management body and mostly by the Supreme Court. Uh, and so I'm going to go through today. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the actual kind of election results, sort of a background on the case that we've been previewed here uh, with the judicial system in Kenya and the precedents it set not only for the country itself and, and the citizens, but also for the wider region. Um, and then we're going to go through the 2022 election just to give an overview of what actually happened in the case. Prior to discussing uh, the research design, this is a more quantitative paper, as you'll see, and then the results and, and some takeaways and conclusions. Um, as I said, this is a pretty early stage paper, so I'm happy to hear any feedback and how best to position this within kind of the wider literature on judicial politics in Africa. Um, but yes, so terrific. We will start off by going through uh, some of the background on courts and democracy in Kenya specifically. So as, as was mentioned, the Kenyan case uh, is kind of the paradigmatic case for Supreme Courts and interventions in judicial politics in the region. Uh, this paper looks at sort of the intersection of electoral politics and the judiciary specifically, uh, and to understand where the Supreme Court got the capacity and kind of independence to annul an election results, which was uh, sort of unheard of in the region at the time, we have to go back to more or less the 2007 election, uh, which was characterized by widespread violence, over 1,000 people killed, 700,000 people displaced in the aftermath of a contentious election. Uh, be, due to both kind of domestic and international pressure, the, con the country decided to uh, kind of build out a new constitution that built in protections around elections specifically, uh, but also reiterated the independence and the kind of um, autonomy of the Supreme Court, which was critical to later decisions. So following the institution of the constitution, uh, the 2017 election, which is two elections afterwards, was the election that Sonali was mentioning earlier. This is one of the first elections in the region and really the first national election in the region in modern times in, the, in democracy to have one of its uh, a widespread election annulled. So there was an appeal by the opposition and there was sufficient evidence uh, presented to the court and their determination that the court or that the election needed to be reheld. And so although the election was boycotted by the opposition, the reheld election, the appeal process and the willingness of the court to hear the details on the evidence of impropriety and those sorts of things uh, allowed them to make the decision and really project to both Kenyans and throughout the region that the court was not beholden to the state. It was not beholden to the political uh, actors in charge of the country, and it really was an independent, uh, an independent court. And this is really critical to building out the precedents uh, for the most recent election, uh, which I will I will dig in here in a moment, uh, which was again appealed. And so building this all together, and we'll kind of discuss through just to give you a preview of sort of what we're interested in here. What, what I'm interested in and what we're interested in this paper is sort of what are the impacts of these decisions? So not necessarily the impacts on whether an election is reheld or upheld, but how does it actually influence individuals and citizens, more importantly, perceptions of election integrity? And how can it actually mitigate uh, the influence of misinformation, which we use sort of as a proxy uh, for engagement at these elections specifically? So I'll dig into that a bit more in a moment, but that's sort of what we're interested in here. So the... Switching over to the 2022 election specifically, uh, so anyone who follows uh, Kenyan politics will know that 
Twitter in particular, but social media in general is, is very widely used in Kenya. Twitter is the most popular social media platform and internet and social media penetration are extremely high, one of the highest in the region. Uh, and this has become very central to Kenyan politics. The debates that continue online, very you know, relevant political debates of the recent protests about tax legislation are very pointed and have involved large swaths of the population from throughout, you know, Generation X, as they're calling the, the recent protests, to older generations, which have had cell phones and been able to engage with the political classes for a lot longer than other countries in the region. Uh, while this has many benefits and it allows people to have open discussions about policies, it also enables very quick uh, reactions to, you know, information that may or may not be true. And so, as has become of interest to researchers, policymakers, um, and academics, not just in the region, but throughout the world, the persistence and kind of amplification of misinformation online has really been enabled by these information and communications technologies. And so while we see that the, the Kenyan election uh, has kind of very robust online debate, both throughout the campaign and in its aftermath, it also is infused with the kind of openings for both kind of deliberate attempts to sully the reputation of of the IEBC and members of the electoral board, but also of, of the candidates and, and many opportunities for people to present evidence that may or may not be intentional, but is evidence of, of kind of impropriety or misinformation. And this is very much what we saw in the case of the Kenyan election. So this project was actually focused on whether election observers could have any influence on uh, the, the persistence or the, the mitigation of election misinformation and their statements. And so I'll, I'll show you uh, soon kind of the, the way that we collected data for this. But what we were interested in following was what was the actual influence of political misinformation targeting these specific candidates, but also the electoral process more generally. So in, in the long run, sort of what is the consequence for democracy when people believe that elections are not free and fair? And so that is really what we're interested in figuring out is can Supreme Courts and can the judiciary play a role in maybe mitigating some of these more disastrous consequences for democracy? And so in this particular election, uh, while there was lots of buildup and it was seen as a very competitive election, the, the candidate who ended up winning the election, William Ruto, who is now president of Kenya, uh, was by many quarters not expected to win the election. This led to a lot of aftermath and speculation uh, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of the election regarding the legality of the election and whether there had been uh, any malfeasance when it comes to uh, kind of election tampering. A lot of this had to do with election technologies. Kenya uses several different types of uh, political technologies uh, to integrate voters, electoral voting systems that were the target of a lot of misinformation. And so in the aftermath, the opposition candidate, um, Raylo Odinga, ended up appealing to the Supreme Court and he came out to his supporters and said, I have you know very confident in evidence that shows that this election was not free and fair. Um, and given the precedent that had been set in the previous election where it had been annulled by a similar appeal by uh, Rayla Odinga, uh, a lot of people in the country thought that there was a decent chance that this would also uh, be annulled and that there would be a re-election. And so on the 21st of, of August, about a week and a half after the election, where Rayla Odinga appealed to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court deliberated for about two weeks very publicly. Uh, the Rayla Odinga campaign brought evidence of potential impropriety to the courts, presented it in front of the judges at the Supreme Court. A lot of this evidence had to do with mismanagement by the electoral management bodies that Sonali was talking about, uh, in particular, the Independent Boundaries, um, Independent Election and Boundaries Commission, which is the, the Kenyan um, electoral management body. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with these technology uh, processes that some people thought were deliberately tampered with and other people thought were just uh, ineffective and had had been uh, had caused uh, votes to be miscounted. And so after about two weeks, and so what this paper is about, uh, the Supreme Court came out and said, not only did they find that the election would be withheld or would, would uphold the election results, and it was a legitimate election, they very strategically and very pointedly pointed to a number of the pieces of evidence brought by the opposition campaign and noted how the evidence did not stack up and how there was insufficient evidence and went kind of one by one through a number of these different misinformation narratives and showed that the evidence presented was either insufficient or outright incorrect. And so I think this was a, a very uh, kind of well-conducted and 
pretty much an ideal circumstance for the Supreme Court to have uh, an influence over perceptions. So it's certainly not a least likely case, uh, but it is an example of, of a court kind of using the independence that it had uh, brought on itself and the legitimacy that it had uh, developed over the course of multiple elections to then publicly state why they upheld the election results. And so what we wanted to know was whether this process, the appeal process, and then the Supreme Court's decision could actually have an impact on voters who were very disenchanted with the election results and had been fed misinformation about the potential results uh, for several weeks throughout the candidacy. And so switching over to the research design, the reason we are able to conduct sort of a more causal analysis on this, uh, this potential election is because we had been running in the field a, a panel survey uh, throughout Kenya with the same uh, voters over time, uh, looking at different election observation questions and particularly looking at the impact and the kind of how often individuals had seen specific pieces of misinformation online. Uh, and so what we did is we recruited people through social media, or we tried to target a, an even sample by age, gender, and region. Uh, so individuals from throughout the country, um, across different ages, across different genders. Uh, and we tracked their opinions throughout the election process. And fortunately for this paper, uh, we had a follow-up study planned with about half the sample. So it's about 800 people that happened to occur in the immediate aftermath of the Supreme Court decision. So the Supreme Court was was uh, came out with this decision on September 5th, and we held our final wave of this survey with the same individual people uh, on September 6th and 7th. And so we have sort of immediate uh, results from the same people who had just recently, you know, answered all of our questions in the post-election period. So we're looking at waves two and three of this survey uh, to see how or whether the Supreme Court in general, um, you know, had any influence on these particular uh, perceptions. And so the actual data that we're looking at here primarily comes from this panel survey data. So this picture here on the left is some of the technology that's used that is was the target of a lot of misinformation, something called you know, Keems Kits and Smartmatic, which you may have heard of if you follow kind of US-based election misinformation. A lot of this and these rumors have become very globalized and they're pretty much copy pasted to different contexts. And so that's one of them we see. A couple of the other rumors that were very prominent were about Chibukati, who was the, the head of the IEBC at the time, the election management body, and the IEBC more generally being either corrupt or incompetent. Um, and so these four rumors were the kind of primary rumors we found in our scanning of the election data, but also the four rumors that were most prominently uh, addressed by the Supreme Court. And so in our panel survey data, we ask a number of kind of perception related uh, questions. So we're interested in knowing as any democracy kind of needs the public support to survive or at least to flourish. We're interested in knowing how did people perceive the fairness of the election over time. So we're comparing people's uh, responses to the question, how free and fair was the recent election, both after the election and before the Supreme Court's decision, and then again after the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, and to pair that with sort of behavioral data, if you can call it that, uh, we collected about 630,000 posts from X Twitter, which again is the most commonly used social media platform in Kenya. And we collected amongst, among uh, a number of keywords related to these specific misinformation narratives. And so discussion of specific misinformation narratives over time. And so with this data, what we're hoping to show is we want to know, you know, can the Supreme Court, and in this case, did the Supreme Court enhance perceptions of election integrity? Uh, and Secondarily, as a kind of uh, more immediate outcome, can they minimize the spread of specific election misinformation narratives? And so getting to the results. And so what we have, uh, we've split this up by the, the two supporter groups, uh, but very optimistically and sort of what we see here, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, but at least very encouragingly, what we find is, is statistically significant increases in the immediate aftermath of the decision amongst the same individuals in response to whether the election was free or fair. Uh, and so we see you know, about a 10% increase in, in perceptions, and so a noted increase across both groups. The Ruto supporters already start near the, the ceiling, so there isn't much room for them to go up. And as, as expected and as results from other elections will show you, when your uh, team or your candidate wins the election, uh, most people will say the election was free or fair, regardless of the actual facts. So what we're more interested in is the kind of Odinga supporters 
whether or not there is some sort of winner's effect and whether or not we can actually address the concerns of individuals who are more likely to be uh, distrusting of the results. And what we find is that there's a much bigger effect and more significant effect amongst Odinga supporters, which we find uh, to be very solid evidence of, of kind of the influence of the Supreme Court on these perceptions. So second, looking at the social media data, uh, we run uh, what we, it's called a regression discontinuity threshold model. So essentially what we do is we take sort of the rolling averages over time across the number of posts in Kenya on these specific election narratives. As you can see uh, from these, it's fairly obvious, but uh, we can, in the paper, we have you know more, more statistical explanations, but essentially once the decision was made, we see sort of across the board discussion about every single one of these narratives drop off. Um, and by the end of, of September, there's very little discussion of these misinformation narratives. So I think the really interesting thing here is that it was a pretty persistent chatter about each of these narratives, with some of them even increasing uh, in their popularity between the election date and the decision date. And this makes a lot of sense if anyone here was following the actual election, where there was kind of continual discussion, the uncertainty that we know fosters uh, the spread of misinformation narratives between the election results and the appeal really kind of incited a lot of interest in whether these rumors were true, people presenting evidence online that was either real or fake or was just evidence of some one-off cases of, of, of uh, you know, broken systems, whether it was the IEBC or whether it was, you know, Smartmatic machines breaking down. And so we find significant results here uh, in the regression discontinuity model that there is kind of a, a, a denouement in the discussion about specific narratives over time. So I think that's a really interesting use of that social media data. Uh, so one of the, oh, here we go, one of the things that uh, might be of concern to people interested in kind of judicial politics that we wanted to look at uh, was whether the Supreme Court's uh, addressing of this misinformation and its willingness to kind of put itself out there to say, we not only are going to uphold these results, but we actually, you know, we aren't going to say anything about the credit. We're going to uphold the results, but we're also going to address the specific pieces of information and kind of strike them down. Uh, people were worried that this might incite, maybe in the short term, people will be placated, but they might downweight their support for the Supreme Court and other judicial bodies, including the actual management body in the long run. So if we wanted to know comparing again, kind of pre and post perceptions of trust in these different election management bodies, whether the Supreme Court's decision reduced trust in the Supreme Court in the long run. And what we find very encouragingly again is not only did it slightly improve perceptions of the IEBC, uh, but persistent support for the legitimacy of the Supreme Court was upheld throughout both periods. And so these are very high, it's, this scale is out of four. And so even amongst Odinga supporters, people are very trusting in the Supreme Court, both before and after the decision. So just to go through some of those results one last time and sort of the main takeaways, uh, what we find from this study is that the Supreme Court's decision uh, likely improved perceptions of the election's legitimacy, which is the main kind of headline finding that we, we take away from this study. Uh, it was enabled by kind of the very fortuitous um, rollout of our our survey panel data. So if anyone ever comes to you and says that you're you're moving too slowly with the panel data, just say, you know, you never know, it could come in handy sometimes. Uh, and so that worked out in our favor here. Uh, in addressing the specific deficiencies, the court was able to potentially reduce the spread of specific election misinformation narratives as well, which we think is a very interesting finding. So not only was the court's decision, they could have simply come out and said, you know, we're upholding the results, but their willingness to dive into the details and to present to the public why they actually came to these conclusions and the absence of evidence that they found in these deliberations, we think was really critical uh, to kind of sustaining their own legitimacy, but also to reducing discussion of these wider narratives. Um, we also find that they this was able to kind of reduce concern over the potential reduction in the legitimacy of, of the IEBC and the Supreme Court. And finally, uh, we just want to note that as, as kind of noted by Sonali, and I'm sure other people on this panel will know, the Kenyan case is, is very specific. It does seem like a, a most likely case because of the independence and goodwill and autonomy that has been built up over the years. I think the Kenyan case really stands out as, as sort of a an excellent example of how to foster 
public trust in a judicial institution and how that can actually come in handy in the case of election um, discrepancies, in the case of these very contentious issues, which in the past had led to violence in the country, the Supreme Court's willingness to kind of put up with a lot of outside pressure and external pressure over time and come to these results is really a, a great example for, for the region, not just the region, but for judicial institutions around the world. So that is the end. Thank you very much. I look forward to your comments. Morgan, thank you so much. Um, you and your co-authors were really able to leverage some unique panel data and you know, congrats on being able to do that. And the findings really um, dovetail with some research that um, Michael Waman and I have done in the context of, of Zambia. So we can talk more about that soon. Uh, unfortunately, I'm taking a look at our program once again, and uh, we don't have any of the other three presenters. So what we're going to do is hand it over to Gabriela uh, Taruco, who has, I mean, uh, you know, tremendous expertise with regard to electoral governance and electoral justice within a context of Latin America. And she's going to provide comment um, for both papers. So Gabriela. Over to you. Thank you, Nicholas. And thanks, Holly and Toby, for, for organizing this conference and for the opportunity to discuss so interesting papers. I learned a lot reading them. And they shed light on my own my own research on electoral adjudication. So first for Sonali, am I pronouncing right your name, Sonali? Uh, congrats for your work. Um, I was thinking that uh, the capacity of EMBs that your uh, subject uh, is at the same time your uh, independent variable and your dependent variable is exogenous and endogenous at the same time. So I think you have material with with so descriptive data, so rich descriptive that data. Uh, you have material to a lot of papers, not one uh, paper. But now I just uh, heard you saying that your dissertation, so it's, it's made all the sense. I, I didn't know that yet. Well, uh, I think you have material for discuss uh, at relationships among uh, between ad, uh, adjudication management, between management and trust, adjudication and trust. But uh, it seems that in this paper that you sent, uh, the most important thing is the relationship um, between electoral governance network and capacity, if I understood correctly. So uh, I would suggest uh, to developing a little bit more about the network approach and how your case fits in this approach. Um, uh, by the way, do you mean a domestic network, right? Like interactions among institutions, the EMB, the courts, the reformers, I think, not international network, right? Uh, it seems. Um, and so I suggest to uh, develop a little bit more on how uh, the other nodes of this network uh, beyond the EMB uh, would, uh, would interact with, with the EMB to improve that, uh, its performance. Uh, what do you expect from the other nodes to improve the performance of EMB? I think uh, if you uh, follow this framing I am suggesting uh, for this paper, uh, that graphs on trust would be less uh, important for your argument, but you would save space to develop more the argument on um, interactions in the network, I think. And about your research question, I, I had made a comment here for you, but in your presentation, you presented the question a little bit different, but I'm going to read my comment because it, it, you wrote that, maybe you can uh, see. I would suggest rephrasing the question for uh, under what conditions does an electoral challenge succeed? And because the way your question was um, before, uh, it was, your hypothesis was inside, it was built into the question. So um, I think the change, the, the environment changing is your uh, hypothesis and not, so these are suggestions for rephrasing the the question. And um, the last thing is that, um, the, a minor thing, uh, is the trust 
your measure for uh, electro integrity or electro capacity. Um, I understood that, but I'm not sure if that is right. I suggest you to discuss a little bit more how trust on the quality of elections would be a good proxy for um, electro integrity and electro capacity. Just as uh, just this for you. Thank you for your work. I, I like it uh, too much. And now some comments for Morgan, Madeleine, and James. Um, um, I, I like it a lot, uh, but I have to admit that I'm not very familiar with survey, but survey and RDD techniques. So I'm going to make comments uh, ha, uh, uh, on how to make your paper more accessible for reader like, readers like me. And uh, because I think your conclusions are amazing and I, I think they are very important and should be shared widely to uh, politicians and practitioners, everybody, um, beyond readers like me. <laughs> so uh, before the other comments, I would say that from a normative uh, point of view, it's very comforting to know that something may work against misinformation and distress. Th thank you for saying this. And um, as a Brazilian, I was thinking how they can do this, how they make people change their minds. We, we must learn how to do this. So um, this is amazing. Um, well, I would suggest you to make your paper more accessible for readers uh, like me. Develop. Uh, I would suggest to develop a little bit more on the research design uh, and how this research design specifically allow, allows you to conclude about impact, about causality. You, you talk uh, about this in your presentation, but I think in the paper it would be good uh, uh, elaborate a little, little bit more on that. And I guess the panel format of surveys is the first, the answer for the first test. But uh, on the uh, discontinuity part, I would like uh, some more explanation about how the coefficients uh, allow you to uh, conclude uh, on impact. Like for readers like me, I see all the cores decreasing just uh, since before the the decision. So uh, would you um, make your paper more accessible if you explain exactly what is the cut, the time? Uh, well, uh, I didn't know even the time would be a good uh, running variable. So please, uh, if you put some more details on that, it would be good for other readers like me. And other thing, uh, while I was reading, as I wonder if uh, would be that the the challenge in the salience of in, uh, in that subject in the Twitter uh, would be um, due due to some other uh, things changing at the same time. But so I, I finished the reading and I found the, the last robustness checks in the end of your supplementary material. And so I would suggest these, these robustness checks put, uh, be put in the, in the test together with the, the, uh, the, the results. And, and I wonder if the, this, that matters uh, um, after the decision uh, deserved fewer posts fewer posts in the Twitter, what subjects arise after that, uh, what subjects replace them in the debate. If I don't know if you have this information, but I, I wonder that if you have, if you know, would be interesting to, to put in the paper. And, and I wonder, uh, uh, I was wondering also about uh, if the change in the posts would be strategic, like, like a constant, a loser's constant, uh, they they may uh, be thinking about their uh, next competition and uh, maybe this is democracy. <laughs> and the the final comment uh, is um, how people know that the court is sufficiently independent from the state. Uh, maybe there is a, a question in the survey, but uh, maybe this is a, a point that deserves more detail in the paper. And that uh, people didn't know that before the decision uh, or the the court is 
is le was less independent before the decision. Um, and um, beyond that, this independence from the state means independent from the government or independent from the political parties. What independence you're talking about? And of course, you don't don't need to answer everything. It's just comments. Thank you for your work. Thank you.